years ago. This would have been like early 1998. I was in New York City seeing a play, The Last Night of Ballyhoo, and it's written by Alfred Urey, who had also done Driving Miss Daisy. And during this play, I'm, I'm sitting behind this really, really tall guy. Uh, and I'm like, like <laughs> come on. And you said, I just want to club this guy on the back of the head for the entire show. You're, you're a walking, talking Looney Tunes cartoon yeah. right there. And the play's over, and I thought, that was good. It's not driving Miss Daisy. And the guy stands up in front of me, still really tall, and it's Michael Eisner, the former head of Disney. Sure. And he turns to the guy next to him. And he says, it's good, but it's no driving Miss Daisy. And with that, Disney turned down this play. They turned down the option on this play. And I saw it happen. This is what it is. This is what it is to be a studio head. You go see a play, and then you turn to the guy afterwards. It's like, that eh, could work. Or it's like, nope, it's not going to do it. And it's him and I had the exact same thought. You should be the head of Disney. I would have made the exact same decision. You've got those instincts. Yes. But... You know, unfortunately, you're not even the head of this show. No, I'm not. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. On our last episode, we watched BMX Bandits. And let me tell you, those kids zipping around on those BMX bikes was quite a sight to behold. But I want them to go faster. Faster! faster! I want someone to strap some motors on those bicycles and turn them into motorcycles. We've watched biker movies on this show before, The Wild Angels, episode 36. But who needs a gang of angels when you're the wild one? Ooh, really? Released in 1953, starring Marlon Brando, Mary Murphy, and Lee Marvin, this film was directed by Laszlo Benedek and produced by Stanley Kramer. Marlon Brando hated the finished film saying, quote, We started out to do something worthwhile, to explain the psychology of the hipster, but somewhere along the way, we went off the track. A lot of the dialogue in this movie, including the famous line, What Have You Got?, was taken from conversations that Kramer, Brando, and screenwriter John Paxton had with actual biker gang members. The film was banned by the British Board of Censors for 14 years. It was given an X certificate in 1967 and finally released to the public in 1968. You think you're tough? I know I'm tough. Yeah, well, it takes a true badass, or wild one, if you will, to stand at death's door and say to yourself, Boy, am I thirsty. It's a flask from Wisconsin's own Death's Door Distillery. Not a sponsor of our show. No, but I will say, Death's Door Gin, the best gin. Actually, now I really want a gin and tonic. What are we rebelling against? Nothing. We're watching a movie over on the old other couch. It's a little something called The Wild One. You gotta fill that yourself. It's called a gift, Matt. <laughs> Bad Marlon Brando impersonation, locked and loaded. Oh, I hope the town isn't overrun by those fast pussycats. Oh, crap. Move the camera! Move the camera! Laszlo! <laughs> ah! Ah! Whoa! Jeez! Ever since train leaving station, <laughs> that effect has just screwed up, screwed up my life. The wild one. When I entered this town, they asked me if I had anything to declare, and I said, only my genius. <laughs> well, at least Stevens is in this. <laughs> Black Rebel Motorcycle Club. Rides into Carbondale. Wild one, 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 wild one. There's a big drag race going on there. But they're not there to participate. They're there to cause trouble. Their leader is Johnny. This race is pretty good. I'm a biker. <laughs> it's me, Ron and Brando, the biker. I told you. <laughs> oh, and they're going to goof around. And they're like, hey, look at us. We're going to get in the way of traffic. Yeah, who cares that a race is going on? We're rebels. One more cute remark and you won't be riding any sickles. I'll put the bunch of you away for a month. But we have a strict no cute remarks. Law on the books. It's from the 1800s. I love whittle puppies. <laughs> one month in jail! And they steal one of the trophies. Turns out it's only a second place trophy. But, you know, he straps the trophy onto the hood of his bike. Right, hood? And off they go to see what other towns they can bother today. <laughs> they ride into another small town, and they decide they're gonna drag for beers. Hey fellas! Drag for beers! Dragon for beers, dragon for beers. Bam, bam. 
They race down the main drag of the town. They run an old man's car off the road. They done ruined my fliver. One of the bikers, Crazy, gets his leg injured. His name is Crazy, and he behaves in a crazy, reckless way. Johnny goes into the bar for a beer, and he meets Kathy. He's all sultry at her, but she's playing it cool as best as she can. Johnny puts on some tunes. Dance, Brando, dance. Yes. Yes, dance, <laughs> Brando. Looks like the Black Rebels are going to be hanging out in town until their buddy's fixed up. Now, if you're going to stay cool, you got to wail. you got to put something down. you got to make some jive. Don't you know what I'm talking about? No! There's this old bartender named Pops, and he doesn't know about any of this newfangled stuff. What about TV? Do you like TV? Everything these days is pictures. I'm only into cave paintings. <laughs> hey, Pops, thumb me, will you, Daddy-o? Come on. Thumb kiss. Now, give me some skin, and... Ooze it out, just nice at boy. Now touch me tenderly. <laughs> hold me, won't you, Pops? Please hold me. And kiss me, kiss me like you mean it. A <laughs> couple of the guys decide to mess with him. To be able to drop the bow. And if you want to, you take a drink and you're all able to bamble with the bamble with the beam. Oh, he's doing a Lenny Bruce routine. <laughs> <laughs> they dance with the ladies. Hey, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? We've got repression, we've got a patriarchal society, <laughs> we've got general uptightness. Uh, take your pick. Johnny dances with Kathy. Kathy acts like she wants none of it. Or doesn't she? Kathy's dad is the local sheriff, but he's a pretty bad policeman. And he looks like William Faulkner. Out there, I think you got me a little wrong. I wrote Absalom, Absalom. <laughs> Why are you trying to be so rude? What have you got? A rival gang, the Beatles. No, not those Beatles. Drive into town, and their leader is Chino. You see, the Beatles and the Black Rebels used to be one gang, and then they split. Johnny comes out to find that Chino has taken his trophy. Things are suddenly tense. I love you, Johnny. I've been looking for you in every ditch from Fresno to here, hoping you was dead. Johnny's like, hey, give me back my trophy. Lee Marvin's like, hey, make me. And they get pushing. <laughs> Brought a shove to a knife fight. <laughs> We all missed you. Did you miss them? Yeah. yeah. The Beatles missed you. The Beatles. I didn't win it, Johnny. I just gleeped it. But I gleeped it off a guy that didn't win it either. Gleep? Hey, I gleeped your pen. Oh, re-gleep. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're fighting. After I'm through with you, you won't be painting any wagons. Is Jack Black? <laughs> I love you. I love you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their horseplay causes another car accident. One of the Beatles almost gets run over. I believe his name is Meatball. That member of the Beatles is having a real hard day's day. Somebody's got to get arrested, and it's going to be Chino. But hey, what about this driver? He was at fault, too. Nope, Chino's going in the can. What did this boy do that uh, Frogface didn't do? Johnny, I want to talk to you a minute. I like you. I want you to marry my daughter. You know, we had the same club once, and the Beatles got on his back all the time. The Beatles! Johnny sees his old flame, Britches. Britch better have my money. <laughs> have you been? Oh, well, I'm still swinging. That's a little graphic. Listen, he put Chino in the can. Why didn't he put that frog face in the can? Because that frog face is from Innsmouth, and those people are frankly frightening. <laughs> Johnny says to Kathy, like my trophy? You want it? I want it. Why don't you take that back so they can give it to somebody who really won it? To what? That's right. Give that MacGuffin to someone else. If I want to, I'm going to take this joint apart, and you're not going to know what hits you. The only one I'm going to let tear my joint apart is my future husband. The day turns into night. Ha ha! <laughs> Girls, gotta enforce the laws. But first, another slug of bourbon. I got to write as you lay dying, as, as, I, oh, as I lay dying. That sounds better. Johnny and the rest of the gang break into the jail. They're going to set Chino free, and they're going to jail this bozo in the car. But Chino's drunk, and he's sleeping it off, so they just leave him there. One day, Chino will grow up. He'll wear sensible slacks, and his name will finally make sense. All the bikers are drunk, and they start trashing the bar. Oh, no, Johnny, do something. Johnny says, nah. What do you want? I want you to call me Britchesless, if you know what I mean. Britches wants to get back together with Johnny, but Johnny is not interested. The townspeople decide to get some guns. Let's put a little mob together and try to scare off these goons. Chino free. <laughs> they break into the beauty salon and they break it all apart.
Well, will you look at that? The rabid rebel dogs ransacked the shampoo shop. They danced with each other in the streets. This is madness. Dig me, I got a merkin on my face. Kathy's on the street. The goons see her, and they start chasing after her. She's got no motorcycle to ride her way on. It's a bunch of jerks doing circles. Like some sort of a circle creeps. <laughs> but Johnny comes and rescues her. Johnny and Kathy go out riding. They're riding through the moonlight. They pull into a park. Johnny does some rough make outing. Blah, 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 blah. Nobody's too good for me. Anybody thinks they're too good for me, I make sure I knock them over sometime. Just like that Blanche Dubois. But then they start talking, and Kathy realizes that she's not afraid of him. You're afraid of me. The only thing I'm afraid of is dark matter. <laughs> Why do you hate everybody? What do they got? Where'd you want this guy to take you, this guy, at a cup of coffee? That long speech of yours effectively killed my boner, so let's go get coffee. <laughs> The Beatles and the Black Rebels have banded together once again to destroy this town. Johnny, I love you. I love you. I'm going to beat you up, and I'm going to love you. He, Johnny is up to no good. We need to get that guy. So he tells the mob. The mob grabs some guns and some pig irons, and they go out and they chase Johnny. Hey, well, this is a good night. I'm, I'm having fun, and I'm not thinking about law. I'm a security guard at Oxford. College in Oxford, Mississippi, and I'm riding, I'm winning the Pulitzer, a Nobel Prize. Okay, enough of my fault. <laughs> we know you read a book. Kathy has a talk to her father who's drunk and he whines about he can't do anything. But if you don't do something, you're worse than any of them. I'm not worse than Meatball. Looks like it might be curtains for Johnny, but Kathy and her dad Harry show up to try and stop the violence. Johnny escapes. Hey! What are you running from? What do you got? Hong Kong. <laughs> He finds his bike. He's pursued by the posse of townsfolk. They throw a thing, and it knocks him off his bike, and his bike continues going, and it runs down Pops. He's dead. Oh, I didn't give TV a chance. The real cops show up, and Johnny gets arrested for killing him. Let's pick up everything and sort it out inside. And they interrogate Johnny. They say, you're going away for a long time, buddy. Johnny clams up. He's not going to talk to some cop. Well, son, you've got yourself something here. This is pretty good treatment. You could expand it, make it into a movie. Maybe, how's this for a title? The Wild One. <laughs> Haven't you anything to say? What, what have, have you, you got? got? <laughs> you got any friends, Johnny? Chino says he loves me. And then he punches me. <laughs> I think you're stupid. Real stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. But two townsfolk come forward and they tell the truth. Johnny gets off. Don't you want to say anything to these people? Do you want to sing anything to these people? But he's not going to say thank you. Just stick your nose back in this county, any of you, and you'll never see daylight again as long as you live. Thanks, Officer Krupke. Krupp you. But Johnny does come back to see Kathy and to give her a little token of his esteem. <laughs> the wild one. Vroom, vroom. You know how to do it. Mm -hmm. There is a movie trope. I don't know when it started, but it continued all the way through the 80s. And it's one I don't like. It's the idea of when you have a gang of criminals, the way they show you that they're criminals is that they always go, <laughs> These people are dangerous because they're basically children. And only one of them seemed dangerous because he was a man, and that was Brando. The most interesting part of that character is the actor playing him. The character is a completely two-dimensional character. But when he moves, oh, that's why we hired the man. He just exudes interestingness. Yeah, well, not just interestingness. This is lust. You watch him when he walks into the bar and he's first looking at Kathy. He's not even talking. <laughs> this is his foreplay. If Brando didn't play that role, this movie would be incredibly boring. Yeah. But there was a character more interesting than Johnny, and that would be Chino. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. His gang does look tough because they're not hoo hoo he he ha ha. Brando's thing that makes him so magnetic is his body and the way he moves. Lee Marvin's thing is his voice. Mm -hmm. Whenever you hear him talk, it's just like, zoop, yeah, I'm listening. See how the timid maiden of the hill clutches the gold to her breast. No one else talked like that probably yeah. in a movie before he showed up. And anyone else trying to do that since would be like, what are you, who are you trying to be? Po possibly Lee Van Cleef. 
Yeah. Also has a very distinct voice. Have you seen Rebel Without a Cause? Oh, yeah. That movie and this movie have something in common. And that is the ineffectual father figure. Why do you think that is? What makes weak children? Weak parents. Right. And the only parent you see in this movie is Harry. So the ineffectual patriarch sort of drives the children into rebelliousness. Mm -hmm. My old man used to hit harder than that. Uh, Shut up. But just the fact that in 1953, that a daughter would speak ill of her father without any sort of prompting, that's something revolutionary. What else do Rebel Without a Cause and this movie have in common? They both have a little kind of treasure that's passed around. There's the trophy in this, and there's the monkey (laughs) clapping thing (laughs) in Rebel Without a Cause. And also, both of these movies play with sexuality in in a strange way. Uh, there's a very strong uh, homosexual undercurrent in Rebel Without a Cause, particularly from Salmonio. Sal- Salmonio, yeah, yeah. You just have these guys who are just mocking the very concept, what's expected of men. Hiya, sweetheart. How they dress up as women, they dance with each other, they're proclaiming their love for each other before oh. beating each other up. And it doesn't seem gay. No. It, and it just seems as though they're saying, you know what, none of the tropes of modern society apply to us. So Brando was disappointed in this movie because it attempted something and it failed at doing it. What was the attempt and how did it fail? Well, they wanted to show what hipsterism was. The psychology of the hipster, that's what he said. Hipsterism, that term has changed over the decades. It used to mean something cool back when I was one. Does he mean like hep cats, that kind of thing? Hipster was a term coined, I believe, by Norman Mailer. Oh, sure. Uh, it's supposed the to be... The white Negro kind of idea. Yeah. We w- listen to jazz. We use the black parlance. Bop me, Dad. I bopped you, Dad. Yeah, we're going to throw heterosexuality back in your face. It's also throwing whiteness back into people's faces. So how they failed is probably because they failed to give us any real characters and they failed to give us any real insight. That's they right. just showed us bad behavior mm-hmm. and that was it. And we didn't even really see two characters... Forming a meaningful connection. They just kind of smile at each other at the yeah. end. Yeah. Eh, it's, it's close. It's close, but yeah. it doesn't quite get there. And there was one other gang member that I thought seemed realistic. Riches. She seemed like she might be an authentic biker babe. I thought I was really living it. I'm kind of the star of my own movie right now. Do you mind, Mr. Brando? <laughs> I'm acting opposite Brando. I'm going to bring it. I got a monologue that he's got to listen to. I'm going to make him listen. <laughs> the rival bike gang in this is named The Beatles. Mm-hmm. In the Beatles anthology documentary series, claims that they got the idea for the name of their band from watching this movie. Which is interesting since the movie was banned in the UK until 1967. But I found out a little more about that. When a movie is banned in the UK, that doesn't mean it can't be shown. It just means it can't be widely distributed. So it is possible that the Beatles could have seen this movie and been inspired by it. But we all know it's because John Lennon had a dream about a flaming pie that told him to call the group the Beatles. And I'm sticking to that story. Or they could have caught it in Germany. Oh, sure. The shot of Johnny and Kathy driving through the moonlight was beautiful. Really nice. And the shot of the moon, which you didn't see much of in American movies in in the early 50s. I like the fact that Chino did not look like a biker. He just looked like this weird hobo. That was a further element of chaos. Like, this guy shows up and it's like, he's not dressed the way he should be. What's he going to do? Yeah, we don't even follow proper dress codes. So, as the Wild One zooms off into the sunset, it is time for Seen It. Seen It. My friend and co-host Craig has seen a lot of movies in his time, but you know what? He hasn't seen every movie, and these days he's a little busy. So this theme for Seen It is Craig Hasn't Seen It. Aramis 419 writes, 1927's The Jazz Singer, the first talkie in Hollywood history. Seen it. Aramis puts talkie in quotation marks, and that is appropriate because you might be surprised to know that The Jazz Singer is a silent movie. It has about three songs in it and one scene of talking. And other than that milestone, it's not a very memorable movie. Jolson really does have charisma, and that comes through in the scene, the one talking scene in the movie that he has with his mother where he's telling his mother he's going to get really famous and he's going to buy her all these things and he's kind of teasing her a little bit and she's going, ooh, and it's a very sweet scene. And that's really all I remember about the movie, except for toot toot tootsie goodbye. And you ain't heard nothing yet, I believe. He says that. Sure. I have not seen that jazz singer. I have seen the Neil Diamond jazz singer from 1980. 
His father, played by Sir Lawrence Olivier. You are not my son! Joyce Padua writes, Seeing as how I'm procrastinating on my final paper about the importance of being earnest, I was wondering if either of you have seen the wild biopic featuring Stephen Fry. Maybe seeing you two discuss these films will get me off my butt and motivate me to do some writing. Seen it. Well, Joyce left this comment several months ago, so either she has finished her paper or has dropped out. But I have seen that movie, and let me tell you something. Take a look at this poster, why don't you? Stephen Fry playing Oscar Wilde. I can't imagine a better actor to do that. This movie is going to be fun. It's going to be witty. Oscar Wilde is going to be taken down, stuffed shirts, parading his fabulousness all over London. Does, isn't that what that poster promises? I think it is. But you know what? The movie does not deliver that whatsoever. This is the most dour <laughs> biopic of Oscar Wilde possible. Now, I know that he had a lot of dark parts of his life, but look at that poster. I want to see that movie. I don't get that movie. It was a little disappointing. This might have been Jude Law's first big or screen appearance. It was his breakthrough, no matter yeah. what. Yeah. As Wilde's impetuous young lover who gets him into a lot of trouble. The movie is just such a downer. You want to see Oscar Wilde's expression throughout 90% of this movie? It's that. You know who I would love to see play Oscar Wilde? Titus from Kimmy Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> Nuck Weiss writes, Have you guys ever seen the 80s movie called Bad Boys starring a young Sean Penn? Seen it. This movie was on cable practically every day. I saw it many times and instilled in me a lifelong terror of prison. Because it's a prison story that pulls no punches. And it features Clancy Brown, who might be the scariest actor ever created. <laughs> By human birth. This was the movie Sean Penn did right after Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So he's just demonstrating right off the gate that he's got range. Mm -hmm. Gnarlin writes, Please talk about the Four Musketeers. No, I can't. I haven't seen it. I have. Oh, have you? We watched the Three Musketeers on this show, and boy, we had a good time. Yeah, and I was ready to see the Four Musketeers. But and then I talked to Matt. Because I saw the Four Musketeers. I was like, more please. And I watched it. And it became very clear to me why they split it up into two movies. It was not a cash grab. It was damage control. <laughs> if they made it one movie, it would have been a half of a really fun movie and then a really dull second half. And it probably would have killed any profits that they would have made. So this was a smart move on the studio's part, even though they didn't do it in the best way. I'm surprised I haven't heard of more movies that have done that. We got a turkey on our hand, but we can salvage it, but we can also make money from the turkey. Yeah. It's going to be Thanksgiving. <laughs> And our turkey sack's going to go up. It's surprising to me that they didn't nip this in the bud during the script phase. Like, look at the script and say, first half of this is really good. Let's just make this. It works as a standalone movie. You yeah. don't need this part. If you have a suggestion for seeing it, leave it in the comments down below. We might read it on the show. You can also check out our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. You can click on the PayPal donation buttons. You can give us a few dollars to support our show if you like the show that's exactly what ian did and he says if you could give a quick hello to joy and lana that would be amazing hey joy hey lana the wild one is now concluded if you haven't seen it check it out and now this hey help this man out help this man out help this man out It's like a Philip Glass composition. <laughs> I love you, Johnny.